welcome to the Film Illiterates Podcast, your home for uninformed, unfiltered, ill-advised movie talk. I'm your host, as always, Joe Campbell, and with me today is Nate Stone. Hey guys, what's up? And Alex Patton. Hello, hello. Hi. So we're going to be starting a, uh, a new direction for the Film Alerts podcast. We've kind of done a, a whole bunch of different topics over the past, what is it, couple years that we've been doing this? Something like that, yeah, about. Yeah, so in, in the past, we've kind of had a general structure about the topics that we talk about on the show. Um, so from now on, for, for the time being, the direction we're going to be taking with the podcast is really focusing on the pick a flick segments that we've done from time to time where each one of us picks a movie for the whole group to watch and talk about as a whole that's going to become kind of the main drive of the podcast going forward now that isn't to say we can't talk about other topics in addition to that but whoever's turn it is to pick can choose something like well maybe we'll talk about a certain franchise or a certain director's filmography just to give uh what three listeners we have out there an idea of what we're doing with the podcast that's that's kind of the direction we're going to be taking it. So hopefully we can have more discoveries for the whole group to watch and talk about. So so no more of these weird um, puppet spider movies that you make us watch. Oh, more puppet spider. I mean, movies. we'll, Thank we, you we'll just have. Yeah, I say exactly. we'll just have fourth stuff now. Oh, okay, gosh, I thought this was going to be such a downer podcast episode, Joe. <laughs> oh boy, do we have an an upbeat episode for you folks today? So to start us off on kind of this this I don't want to say it's a clean slate of film illiterates, but really trying to push us forward into the, what is this two months into twenty twenty? We're, we're we're okay. We got this. Yeah, yeah. So I I picked for us to watch the 2013 movie Short Term 12, directed by Destin Daniel Cretton. But before we get into talking about Short Term 12, we're going to talk about what we've watched this week. So to kick us off, I guess I'll start since it was my, my week to choose the movie. I... Guys, I got to the, the movie theater for the first time in almost an entire year. Wow. wow. Wait, no. No, you went to the movie theaters quite a few. Oh, or not the drive-in this time. Well, it's the it, actual movie theater. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I should, I should clarify. I went to an indoor movie theater uh, as opposed to the, the drive-in. Drive-in's great. I've been going to the drive-in a lot in the past year. But so my, my local movie theater is currently doing a thing where you can rent out the theater for private screenings for uh, certain blocks of time, specifically, you know, two hours at, at, at a time. So it's it's not like you're like buying out an entire theater for a huge party or anything like that. You just, you're, you're renting it for, it's still expensive, but a little bit, you know, of, of, of less of an amount than you usually would for, you know, you're, you're not renting out like an entire stadium worth of seats. You're not, you're not buying out each individual seat. You're just renting the theater for a little block of time. And that's one way that they're trying to make money. Uh, over the course of this whole coronavirus thing when they've been closed for almost the entire time. So as a birthday present, Katie and I rented out the theater. Uh, we get to bring any movie you want to watch. So we brought my Blu-ray of Black Narcissus, the uh, Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger movie, which, by the way, we have done a video on. If you want to check that out. Which actually is probably a very good one as well. So please go check it out. Yeah, I was just rewatching it. Yeah. 2015, guys. That was, that was, what, six years ago we did that video. You know, the one thing that kind of sticks out with that video is the incense sticks that we put in front of the camera. <laughs> I I don't, I, I saw that too, and I was like, what, why the hell did I do that? What was I doing? No, I think that was me. I think that I was just like, I decided to put that there. It's like, uh, you know, Himalayas, incense, why not? <laughs> it just looks like it's like a lost episode of that 70s show when they're doing the whole, you know, weed spin around table. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Anyway, if you want to hear our thoughts on Black Narcissus back then, uh, check it out. We were very high on the movie. We loved it. Mm-hmm. Uh, hot take. It's still a great movie. 1947. A group of nuns struggle to establish a convent in the Himalayas while isolation, extreme weather, altitude, and culture clashes all conspire to drive the well-intentioned missionaries mad. So one of the really cool things, though, about seeing this movie on the big screen was... I. I know for a lot of people, being able to see the seams and the imperfections in a movie pulls them out of it. But for movies specifically from this era, the 1940s, 30s, 50s, you know, even up through the 80s, I like being able to see the imperfections in some of the effects. You know, like I, I, I like being able to see that, oh, that's 
clearly a model they use for that shot. Or, you know, you know, in, in this movie, there's another shot, you know, that famous shot looking down with, from the bell tower where you can see where the set ends and the matte painting begins. I like seeing that stuff, that stuff because it sort of makes the craftsmanship behind it more tangible. It feels like you're looking at an actual piece of art in front of you. There's, there's one point where they cut to a shot of the Himalayas and, you know, seeing this blown up on the big screen is clearly just a painting. The movie is no less beautiful. It is a striking, visually stunning movie. Uh, and, and I just kind of liked being able to catch little stuff like that. You can, you can catch the, the, the makeup on the actress's faces, you know, on the, and, and the close-ups, especially uh, towards the end there with Sister Ruth. It's just, oh man, the, the colors in this movie is just so beautiful. So yeah, Black Narcissus, highly recommend. And it was just kind of a really cool experience being able to see it in a theater. Now, here's a question, Joe. Have you actually watched the new show, Black Narcissus, that is kind I of have. loosely based on this uh, I mean, obviously, I feel like we could share those thoughts for another podcast, but I'm kind of curious what you think being compared to this one. Well, I mean, compared to the original, it's it's nothing. I I, I enjoyed the new Black Narcissus. The, it was an, an FX show, I, I believe, a miniseries. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I watched that back when that came out. I was really looking forward to it. I, I thought it was a fine, modern adaptation. I liked that it didn't get as i guess sleazy as i expected it to considering the subject matter and also the same fx team that was behind like you know american horror story as well as you know i think ratchet i think yeah what was it was it the same team though because i know that bbc was involved in this one too yeah i don't know someone probably gonna call us out for who did this wrong but i believe it was the same team same kind of like creative producers behind it yeah, I know. I know it was a woman director who who made it, uh, which was interesting because, it, I, I mean, I mean, I, I I didn't love the the movie slash miniseries, um, but I I thought it was one of the better things that came out last year, and I I was kind of disappointed to see that it didn't make a lot of people's lists of you know, female directed movies that came out from twenty twenty. That's just me being someone being one of probably in the minority of people who actually enjoyed it. I mean, I'm. I'm kind of like with this movie i'm kind of a purist to a certain degree i think black narcissus kind of like it's meant, it's funny that you mentioned joe that there's a lot of people who call out all the imperfections of the original uh, michael powell film because i don't know those matte paintings i still think hold up to today when you look and compare it to like what they were dealing with at the time oh, i mean beautiful. for me yeah but that's why for me that's a masterpiece so the fact that someone thought hey let's remake this almost seems uh unnecessary but i don't know maybe like i haven't seen the show i haven't seen the miniseries so maybe there was something new they brought to it yeah yeah in, in my in my opinion there's i mean any any remake is either i mean could be considered either necessary or unnecessary i i, I think i think i kind of like to judge things on their own merits i like to be able to see a new interpretation of any sort of property uh a lot of the times that opportunity is wasted where you, they don't really bring anything new to the table I didn't think the FX miniseries necessarily brought anything new to the table, but it did a fine job of adapting the same story with modern sensibilities. If you're going to watch Black Narcissus, watch the original one, by all means. Um, if you're interested in the remake, I, I, I think it's fine. I think it, it gets the job done. All right, so the, uh, another thing I'm going to talk about is a 2020 movie that I didn't get around to till just now. That is Freaky, directed by Christopher Landon. After swapping bodies with a deranged serial killer, a young girl in high school discovers she has less than 24 hours before the change becomes permanent. Stars Vince Vaughn and Catherine Newton. This is the same guy who did Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to You. I was looking forward to this movie, partially because I enjoy Happy Death Day, partially because it, it just looks like so much damn fun. Christopher Landon seems like he's basing his career on taking... 80s comedies like supernatural comedies and putting them in slasher settings which i am all here for i thought freaky was a lot of fun nice i mean it's definitely uh from the same blumhouse producers right studio it is yes i believe it is i think it is okay yeah it's i kind of like how they're kind of getting into a little bit more variety other than just like um the insidious and the uh Gosh, Annabelle kind of like look for their films and they kind of like are going into a bit more of like this slasher, sleazy, B-rated comedy kind of, you know, slasher kind of film. I kind of like that. 
Yeah, for me, the 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 highlight of the movie is seeing Vince Vaughn prance around trying to act like a teenage girl. Uh, there's there, there's a certain scene where he's running through trying to get his friend's attention. He's just like, "Come on, guys, guys, no, stop it! Come on, guys!" It's just the it's so stupid. Is there something just very inherently funny about watching, like knowing that it's Vince Vaughn just doing this? Uh, it's it's I, I don't know. The, the whole movie is very silly. It knows what it is. The opening. Yeah. I- the opening scene is probably the best love letter to the Friday the 13th franchise that I've seen in a long time. It's just a straight up Friday the 13th style uh, set piece, but oh, done nice. in kind of this modern day light. You know, the, the, the way it's filmed is, is very, very modern and everything. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed Freaky. It's a, it's a very dumb, very silly movie. And it's 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 funny. I mean, it can't be as any more dumb than a Rob Schneider in The Hot Chick, so that's all I have to say. And uh, last movie I'm going to touch on real quick is a 2021 release, which, guys, I haven't seen very many. I've seen, like, I think, like, two movies from 2021. I need to, I need to start hunting these down because there are not many of them. So I watched Space Sweepers, directed by Sung Hee Jo. He's a Korean director uh, set in the year 2092 and follows the crew of a space junk collector ship called the Victory. When they discover a humanoid robot named Dorothy that's known to be a weapon of mass destruction, they get involved in a risky business deal. So this director is the same guy that's done a few different movies that I actually quite enjoy. He did Phantom Detective, which was kind of a a heightened comedy detective noir uh, shot kind of like an anime almost. I mean, it's live action, but it's very kind of a heightened reality kind of look to it. He did a movie called A Werewolf Boy, which I loved. So when I found out he had a new movie out on Netflix, a, a space epic, I was got very excited. I had to check it out right away. And this is this is just kind of again like like freaky. It's an overall good time with 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 the movies. It's about a ragtag group of space junkers who just kind of, they, they find this little girl that turns out to be this this robot, but it's kind of unknown whether she knows she's a robot or not. And they're trying to find out what to do with her. And they get involved with, you know, this is in a future where Earth is dying and this kind of Elon Musk-esque guy is trying to terraform Mars and trying to move everybody to Mars. And there's, you know, planet-killing weapons involved and... There's a wacky robot sidekick character, like like, like actual android, who wants to uh, get get a a procedure to make him look like a human, and just all sorts of like big weird ideas. There's nanobots. There's maybe uh, psychic powers involved. Just all sorts of this, this crazy weird big sci-fi mashup stuff in this kind of space junkers Firefly esque kind of movie. So I yeah I, I I really enjoyed this and I highly recommend checking it out. It's it's a lot. There's a lot in the movie and it kind of all doesn't necessarily mesh together very well. But the movie itself is a very fun time. Yeah, just from your description of it, I'm like I have to see this just to get a better description in my head of what this looks like because you just threw a lot. There is a lot in the movie. So anyway, that's that's what I got this week. Alex, what you got? All righty. So I watched recently. Watched a couple of uh, classic 80s movies with Jean-Claude Van Damme. So I watched Bloodsport and Kickboxer. For my uh, like friends like a uh, film club over Discord. <clears throat> uh, the first one we watched, we watched, uh, we watched Bloodsport. Um, and at, out of the two, I think I prefer this one. It's a little bit... The story is just a little bit more interesting. Um. But the basic idea of it is Jean-Claude Van Damme is Frank Dukes. Um, he gets to fight in a the Kumite. It's like a secret martial arts tournament that's like happens only was like every like five years or something like that. Kumite, but- Kumite, <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's all just about him like traveling to Hong Kong and fighting in it. It, it, it's just it's just it's a very simple kind of idea but it's it's very cheesy but it's very fun at the same time because it's like you're, you're not really watching it for the um for like the story you're watching it 
to see Jean-Claude Van Damme kick ass. And that's what you get. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can really ask for. This, this, like I said, the story, the story is not the main, um, the main draw of it, but it, it's, it's good enough that it'll, it'll keep you kind of like going along even, even between the fights. So I can't really complain too much about that, that part of it. The fighting is, is great. It's, it's what you want from a Jean-Claude, 80s Jean-Claude Van Damme movie like there's nothing really to complain about there it's it's good um other than that uh, we also watched uh so we also watched Kickboxer uh this one was not as great uh, there was a lot less I think mostly it came down to the fact that there was a lot less fighting in it so it was just less entertaining if you ask me um the story itself is okay it's it's about um jean-claude van damme and his brother in the movie um uh, travel to thai uh was it where did they go thailand yeah they go travel to thailand for um it's essentially for his, so his jean-claude van damme's brother could uh fight like the best kickboxer that there um and he gets his ass smoked so then Jean-Claude Van Damme has to fight the kick, best kickboxer and, you know, get revenge for his brother. And there's like a couple fight scenes, like two major ones, and they're not that great. I mean, they're okay. The, fight, the last fight scene is kind of cool. But other than that, it's it's really not that fascinating. Um, everything else is like mo- is really just like him training, which that's fine, you know. But it lasts for way too long, and it takes up for me way too, way too much of the movie. It just goes on forever and ever, and it's just like, can we just get to some like actual action rather than just like seeing him work out in random like ruins and stuff like that in Thailand for like the twentieth time? But overall, it's I mean, it's still like just it's still just like a cheesy eighties movie, so it's not like that bad. If it's something, it's if it's something that you can just put on with your friends and still enjoy and just like chill to. But if you had a choice between Kickboxer and Bloodsport, I 100 uh, percent recommend Bloodsport over the, over that. I would like to uh, also say that I get th- throw in, throw in my own uh, uh, nomination for Bloodsport as greatest cheesy 80s action movie ever made. Oh, I I don't know, I don't know. Um, I think. Uh... Big Trouble. Uh, sorry, was it uh, Escape from New York? I still think holds a soft spot in my heart. So sorry. Great movies, both great movies. Bloodsport though is just I, I'm I'm here I'm here all day for uh, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme breaking people's limbs. <laughs> Who isn't there for us to see that? That's always and punching like bricks and punching bricks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Blood, yeah. Bloodsport was cool. I like the. It was nice too because Bloodsport you had you had a bunch of different other people fighting too as well. So like it wasn't just Jean Claude Van Damme kicking ass. You got to see other people kick ass and get their asses kicked too. So you know, it, like I said, it, there's just more fighting in it uh, compared to Kickboxer, and I think that's why it just pulls ahead for me. Yeah, <laughs> literally <laughs> pulls ahead. Pulls ahead. I knew what you did there. I mean, nobody pulls ahead in the movie. I I, I, I haven't seen huh? it in five years, but never mind. I don't, I don't killed, know what you're talking about. Killed the joke, Alex. You killed the joke. <laughs> you killed you it. You did not make a good joke. It's your honestly, you guys are killing, honestly, you guys are killing jokes faster than I am. So, oh my Tou- god, touche. Take my hat Anyway, the other movie that I've watched is uh, Red Line. The, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. You saw our? Oh my god, no, our, no, our, no. Our college movie, no. Red Line. God, no, no, not that one. <laughs> Not that one. Uh, 2009 uh, anime red line. Let's be clear. It's, it's, okay. me, it's me we're talking about here. So, of course, That's it's the anime movie. For people who don't know what uh, Nate's talking about, we, we all went to the same film school where we shot a student film. Oh, well, the school shot a student film called Red Line that some of us were involved in. Um, so it's... <laughs> so <laughs> so Look it up. Look it up if you want to. Yeah, I feel. I feel like honestly, one of these days we just should just sit down and, and just riff that movie. To oh my gosh, I'd be sure. all here for that. I would not be opposed. I would definitely be here in two heartbeats. I'd fly up there to Washington just to do this <laughs> with you, Joe. Recreate the set. Anyway, so, so, sorry, sorry, Alex. Alex, no. tell us about the the real red line. 
the mm-hmm. real red line, the good red line. Yes. Um, I'll give you the short synopsis here, but uh, a daredevil driver, Sweet JP, is determined to compete in red line, the most popular race in the galaxy. The race only occurs every five years, but in order to participate, he must overcome the mafia, the government, and even love. It's a really cool movie. It's all, and it, and it just like it starts off and it just goes. It's just you know pedal to the floor. It's just off, man. Um, the animation is it, it looks a little different than what you at least what I you know what a lot of people have kind of come to know as anime. Um, and it looks different than I'd say probably a lot of other like well-known and popular anime movies such as like studio ghibli or like your name that kind of stuff so it, it's got its own unique kind of like sort of grittier style to it and it's more stylized than or stylized differently i should say than other other current anime um or even i maybe even other anime of its time because this was released back in um 2009 actually just looking at the anime style uh, it kind of reminds me of a uh, jojo bizarre's adventure oh yeah jojo's as far as like their lines and yeah, it kind of it reminds me. Of yeah. It's got, it's got a similar look to it. Maybe, maybe they were kind of, I don't know which one came first cause I'm not, I haven't really watched any of uh, Jojo's, but um, yeah, I mean, maybe Jojo's was uh, inspired by it. Who knows? Or, I mean, this guy's hair, I'm, I'm just looking at the, the main character. His hair is fantastic. Oh, awesome. Like pompadour. Yeah, yeah. He's making Johnny Bravo work for his money. Like, geez. Oh, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Oh, for sure. He's so cool. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just a rad film, honestly. Um, kind of interesting too, is like the movie took seven years to make It's seven years Jesus. and over a hundred thousand frames, like all like hand drawn too, as well. This, the story behind the story for red line, I kind of feel like it's similar in, in a sense to blood sport and the fact that the story isn't necessarily what matters so much. Like it's, it's a, it, the story is good. It, it, it is, it is a very helpful component to the movie, but what I think you're really there for again, similar to bullet sport is the action. And, and instead of, um, instead of fighting this case, it's racing. The animation does really well in showcasing a lot of like the really cool moments and um, kind of, Sh- yeah showing you like just how fast these guys are really really going um it's got a pretty cool cast of characters as well but some of them are kind of handled a little bit better than others like some of the other racers that he's um that he that he's against in the red line race they'll they're kind of like introduced and then they'll take sort of like minor ro- roles and then like towards the end one of them will like pop up out of nowhere as like supposedly like this thing he's been fighting against this whole entire time and like this was his like main opponent and you're kind of like wondering well we didn't really get that sense of that when no one it didn't really show us that that was the case here so there's not a lot of good setup and payoff is what you're saying. sort it's- of there's there's a little bit of it here and there sure but as far as like the character kind of arc, I guess I'm not really, not really sure. Not really arc, but um, as, as far as like handling side characters and, you know, everyone not directly kind of involved in like the main characters storyline, it's, it, it does it so, so it's not that great, but it services the movie well enough that you can kind of still follow along and, you know, be all right if you kind of let it go a little bit. But yeah, the the main thing that shines for it is really just the action and the animation because it's just rad as hell. Nice. I'll have to check this out now. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. It's not it's not a super well known film, um, at least outside of like the anime community. So it's it's cool to ha- be able to get it like out there a little bit more because I think it I think it I despite the criticisms, I do think it should be seen more. All right. Is that all you got, Alex? Yes, that's all I got. So, Nate. All right. Um, for me, I'll be really quick. I think these, this past month, I have not had a chance to watch any new movies, except for two and a new show. Uh, so I had a chance to finally get HBO Max. 
And Woo! I just, yeah, I'm on board with the streaming services. So I watched Wonder Woman 1984. So I will not rip a hole into this one because I think the internet has done a fine job of that, sadly. Um, and it sucks because I think Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot has been like the one saving grace of the Zack Snyder Justice League universe, DC universe that's been going on. She does a good job with, you know, what she's given. I think the story, you can see where the producers came in and it's a bit of a mess. Um, but honestly, I think just the one thing I enjoyed the most of it was Pedro Pascal's part. Of all the other talent that comes into this, I enjoyed him the most. Um, he just really just enjoys his character, really hems it up. And I don't know, it just, he just has good chops in there. And I think Joe and Alex, you've been kind of hinting at like this, there's this 880s, you know. Like revival? Is that what you're going for? I wouldn't say revival, but it's kind of like that, you know, campiness, that kind for, of silly. For 80s movies specifically, and, and the, well, for Wonder Woman's uh, 1984 specifically, I would say there's kind of like a, uh, a, a goofy optimism about it. Yeah, there is a goofy optimism, and it just has a hard time balancing that out. Because I see where it's trying to put it in, and then it's not working. Um, and I just think if that was the case, they should have just gone all with that. Um, so that's my two cents on it. Otherwise, it was interesting. Uh, the other movie I ended up seeing was uh, The Little Things, the new um, detective thriller starring uh, Denzel Washington, Rami Malek, as well as the wonderfully optimistic and kind, loving actor Jared Leto. <laughs> uh, this was an okay movie. Um, it's basically run-of-the-mill, typical detective drama thriller. Um, there's not anything really new being brought to the story. I think it's almost uh, kind of a bit of a tease, but I think, as always, Denzel Washington does a great job. Jared Leto does a really good job, too. Rami Malek is the only one who I think uh, does not do as well as I was hoping he would. He just feels really awkward on screen. Rami Malek, who will also show up later on this podcast. Yes. I mean, that's kind of funny that you decided to have us watch this movie because I completely spaced that he was in uh, Short Term 12. Um, and then finally, I'm starting to watch uh, WandaVision, the new show um, or miniseries on Disney Plus that chronicles an alternative universe where Wanda and Vision share a life together, but they don't realize that the wonderful, pleasant suburban life that they're living is one being fabricated before their very eyes. So this is starring Elizabeth Olsen, as well as Paula Bettany, as well as uh, Kathleen Hahn, uh, Kate Dennings, and Evan Peters. Probably a spoiler I just gave away there for anyone who's just not Evan seen the show. Peters. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's totally spoiled for me. Yeah, he, Alex, has he no idea. Have you seen a single MCU movie, Alex? Yeah, oh yeah, I've seen, I've seen a bunch of them. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> you were one of those. I just don't remember his name. No. Okay, I looked him up. Now, yeah, now I know who he is. I mean, can you doubt? I mean, now that they've owned 20th Century Fox and the X-Men franchise, is going to happen. But anywho... Um, I will say I like the show. I think uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of fans who just did not understand what was going on and they had a hard time liking it just because it keeps switching things up. But then at the fourth episode, everyone keeps saying that's like the game changer. That's what like gets people hooked into the show. And it's true. Once that episode comes, you're really locked in for the ride. Um, so I've been watching with some friends. We're all liking it. And obviously every Friday, we try to check it out. Um, there's a lot of how this will play into the cinematic Marvel Universe, which kind of gets me excited. Um, it'll get very complex. So if anyone gets confused watching the show and they have not seen any other Marvel movies before this, revisit those Marvel movies before jumping into this because a lot of other things will make sense. So I'm, I'm really enjoying WandaVision so far, but I've got to say, first couple episodes, I was kind of dreading the fact that the show eventually had to break the sitcom format. And I knew, oh, they're going to get real. They're going to get emotional. It's going to get dark. Because I was just enjoying seeing these characters within these old timey sitcoms. And I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm really enjoying where they're going with the show. I'm on board. I'm hooked mm -hmm. on every episode. There's also part of me that would have been 100% on board with just a sitcom with wanda and vision with no explanations just this is what's happening now enjoy it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah well i mean i would be on that board with that too except a lot of the humor i feel is very dry but it's intentional um 
dry to the point I love where the floating like props food. on the strings. <laughs> oh, oh, no, yeah, but that, that stuff's great. It's all homage to, like, you know, the wonderful Dick Van Dyke shows and Bewitch shows. But um, as we get further into the show, um, you'll start seeing a lot more so commentary that's happening with, like, sitcoms and where they've come today. And there's something I think interesting what they're doing and how they're bringing certain characters into this world. Um, so I like where the commentary is going with that. It's something my friends and I, we geek out about because we're big comic book nerds. So we'll just like start theorizing what's going on. Um, but yeah, for anyone who has not watched this, but has not seen any of the other MCU movies, check those out first before getting into this. And that's it. So with that, we will move into Black Narcissus. Uh, not Black Narcissus. <laughs> what am I talking about? <laughs> Surprise! Talk about again. Surprise! Surprise! This is a Black Narcissus episode. With that, we will go into Short Term 12. Good morning. Hi. Nate, this is Grace. She's your new boss. Bro. Hey, mm-hmm. nice to meet you. I would lose a tie if I were you. Here we go, Nate. Wait, what? Sammy! Okay. Welcome to Short Term 12, man. All right. How long do they stay here? Supposedly less than a year, but we have a few that have been here a little over three. We just keep them until the county figures out where they're going to go next. (laughs) What's going on in my head? Flowers. They represent the peculiar thoughts that grow out of your gorgeous mind. This is Jaden. Last week, she bit her therapist's news. I told her father we'd take good care of her. I take good care of everyone. Yep, I know the rules. No belts, no razors, no scissors, no fucking freedom. No cussing. Shit, I forgot about that one. Short Term 12 is a 2013 movie directed by Destin Daniel Cretton. A 20-something supervising staff member of a residential treatment facility navigates the troubled waters of that world, alongside her co-worker and longtime boyfriend. The film stars Brie Larson, John Gallagher Jr., Rami Malek, Lakeith Stanfield, and Caitlin Dever. So, this was my pick this week. I chose Short Term 12 because this was playing at the movie theater that I was working at at the time, back in 2013. And I I always heard good things about it. Everybody I worked with went to go see it. For some reason, I just never got around to it. It was one of those movies where I was interested, but... If the the specific time didn't show up where it's like, oh, okay, I've got nothing going on right now. I guess I'll go see Short Term 12. That wouldn't have been my first pick. I'm guessing I probably prioritize other movies ahead of it. But I've, I've always wanted to watch it. I've always heard good things about it over the years. And when we started doing this podcast and I was looking at movies to watch, I saw this sitting at the bottom of my watch list. And I thought, you know what? Why not? I should get around to this. So I had us all watch Short Term 12. And uh, oh, boy. This is a positive, uplifting movie to watch right after 2020. <laughs> oh my gosh, you suck, Joe. You, I, you I, kind I, of I, always find these movies that either like freak us out or leaves on such a wonderful note. I'm, I've got to say, I really dug this movie. I loved it. I thought it was very poignant. I thought it was, it dealt with some very heavy themes very gracefully. With movies like this, whenever I know that they're going to deal with these very heavy adult issues i'm always worried that they're gonna kind of slip up and try to take an endearing look at it but still end up being unintentionally cynical and kind of nihilistic in the end like like, i feel like a lot of movies that deal with these sorts of themes kind of look at it from a wow this really sucks here are characters being really human and being real about what's going on but it still sucks in the end you know and this movie i felt like did a good job of balancing the fact that, yeah, these kind of e- emotions and issues are very raw and very powerful and it will hurt, you know, but there, that's not the end to it. There is a way to work through it. I, I like what I had to say about opening up emotionally, working through some of these issues that you may have and you just don't know how to talk about it. You have people trying to connect with you and you don't know how to articulate how you're feeling because it's so internalized within you. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect to it. And I felt like the way it concluded, I, I've seen some people say that it comes off as a little bit kind of schmaltzy at the end, but I I like that it's not all doom and gloom the whole movie. It gets real, it gets dark, but you know, it's never suffocating. 
So, and, and it was just fun to see a lot of these, a lot of these actors, you know, in their, some of these early roles. I know I'm, some of them, it was their first movie. Some of them had been acting for a while, but it hadn't really come to the kind of prominence that they deserved at that point. So it was really cool seeing this, this, this big cast of actors, seeing where they are today and how they started off back then. Yeah, it's like you can look back and it's like, you know, nine years, sorry, like almost 10 years ago. Like this is where they were all at. And it's, you know, just seeing them all grown up now and just making names for themselves. It's like, you're right. This was like their big breakthrough. And Joe, I kind of, I remember actually seeing this movie a while ago before this podcast. Um, Cause I had seen in the film circuit, everyone was talking about this raw indie film that just deals with trauma in such a interesting light. And at the time I was kind of a little taken back with how heavy it was, but I think watching it again, and revisiting again, I see a lot of just great catharsis happening in this movie. Um, the director, uh, Creighton, as well as like all the actors, Bree, uh, John Gallagher, and even Keith, are putting a lot of great stuff in this movie. Um, and we'll get into this later on. Um, but this was like one of those movies where I think everybody wanted to treat this with honesty and respect because this is a very sensitive topic of not just dealing with people dealing with depression and trauma, but kids dealing with trauma and also separation issues. Like a lot of these kids are in pretty much a treatment facility, but also they're kind of owned by the state. They can't have or live with any guardians at the time. And seeing that is kind of in its rawness, but also it's kind of most vulnerable is great. And I think the guys did a great job with this. You know what's another movie, another Brie Larson movie this movie reminded me of was Room from 2015. Which actually, funny enough, uh, the director, uh, Lenny, who directed Room, saw this movie and casted Brie Larson for the very specifically reason for her portrayal in Short Term 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bo- both movies, very, I don't want to say low key, but they're very kind of contained, insular movies set in, you know, houses and buildings, not, not not really big landscapes or anything like that, just very kind of uh, suburban settings with just people dealing with very powerful, harmful abuse and, and outs, outside abusers coming in about people trying to internalize all that and how that affects them. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. And she, she's fantastic in both movies. Yeah, actually, I wanted to say something about this movie in regards with Brie Larson. In, in my opinion, I think her acting shines the best in these kinds of roles. Like her part in Room, her part in this, it's just done. She she brings out her best in this. And not saying that she doesn't do a good job as Carol Danvers and Captain Marvel, but I think uh, this is where her strength lies. And interesting enough, I don't know, have you guys heard about the short film that this was originally based off of? I heard the the, the direct, there was something that the director did while he was in college, I think, it was, or maybe it was like his thesis or whatever his like finishing project for uh, while he was in college in, in san diego actually too yeah yeah that was actually something i looked up and it was interesting that he had shot this while in san diego um funny enough the only actor that actually came back was lakeith and i'll get into something interesting about that but originally the main character was a guy and for the film he changed it for brie larson's character which i think adds something very great to this it brings this kind of maternal figure to this group of kids who every day it's a new hurdle that she has to go through another kid she has to chase before they reach the gate. And you see this devoted maternal figure while she's dealing with her own trauma and experience as well and trying to move on past that. And I don't know, I think making that small change actually does great stuff for this movie. Now, Alex, had you seen this movie before and what was your experience like watching it this time? I, I hadn't seen it before. It, it's something that I had on my my watch list for I don't know, I don't know how long now years. Um, but I mean, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I think it's a really good movie. I was actually surprised because for whatever reason, going into it, I I I probably have like read or heard something else. Other people talking about it, saying like how it's like super depressing and it's like such a, like a I don't know. It's just, just like such a bummer to watch. And like, well, yeah, it, I mean, there is that aspect of it, but it wasn't, it wasn't as sad as I thought it was going to be, which is kind of nice. <laughs> Honestly, like it, it, it definitely hits those points where it just like everything just like 
just sucks. But it it never gets to the point where it's just like entirely hopeless or like, and it it feels like it, it does deal with some like really heavy and important things to to discuss, especially within movies. It never kind of got to the point where it was just like going for something like incredibly dark. It was all a lot more grounded, I guess. It isn't Dear Zachary. Oh, I have that's I also have not seen that one. Oh my gosh. You need to watch I mean Dear Zachary is very, very powerful documentary. Yeah. It is also soul crushing. Um yeah. so I just want maybe kind of like announce to everybody. I think Joe's now made a resolution to be the one watching all these depressing films with us. So <laughs> expect that to come. Goodbye, cheesy B movies. Hello. Depression. Depression. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend, as he would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I actually say something? I think the scene, there's a lot of good scenes in this movie, but I think the scene yeah. that really kind of sets the tone of what this movie is going to be is the opening scene yeah. where we have the actors, you know, it's very now it's a new day. He's kind of, kind of going through like John Gallagher sharing like this personal anecdote story of like, you know, when he's on the bus and he had bad tacos, trying to like bust the chops of like everybody, get them all laughing. And then suddenly one of the kids who I guess is dealing with, um, either autism or something like that is just runs out and he's trying to make it way for the gate and they tackle him and are trying to calm him down while he's still trying to finish and telling the, the joke of the story. And that scene, I think just really sets the tone of this world where there are these guys who they all go through this every single day. It's a roller coaster. You never know what's going to happen to these kids. They can be fine one second and then another second they are wanting to sadly cut themselves or just, do something horrible to themselves and they have to keep like that surveillance on them all the time. And it just really does set this world for you in that opening scene. And that's done very well, I think. Yeah. That was my first note for then watching it. It was just like, that's, that's a hell of a way to open a movie. Honestly, it's perfect. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredibly engaging. Like I saw that and I was just like, all right, I'm hooked. You got me. Let's go. Yeah. And uh, what's kind of cool is like a, a lot of the, like the stuff that is in this movie, the director um, admits actually in a lot of interviews that he wrote this with his personal experience working as a uh, uh, kind of like a facilitator hand in a similar um, troubled teen um, facility center like this. So a lot of what he's bringing to the film is stuff he witnessed, stuff that he saw. And so it does have that personal touch to it where, you know, you have the, the autistic boy who is playing with his sister dolls, or you have like Keith, who's basically, you know, he's coming from a, a parent abuse background while still trying to express himself through music, through his beats, through his, you know, um, trauma. And also the girl uh, who basically, you know, she is trying to recover being a cutter and something like in just like what she draws and what she wears really shows that. And I think all that stuff is what, you know, Creighton just brought from his personal experience and people he saw working with that. Hey, I think most of you have already met her, but we have a new member of our community. Jaden, would you introduce yourself? Um, please don't be offended if I'm not very friendly, but I'm going to be living with my dad soon, and I don't really like wasting time on short term relationships, so, you know, it's nothing personal. Wow. She seems like a really nice girl. Hey, I think we all can respect her space, okay? Okay, what do we want to play for rec today? Wiffle ball, dude. Okay. Oh, man. You're always playing that stupid game. Because you always suck at it. Until you get good at it, maybe we can stop playing it. Watch your mouth, bro. Both of you, cut it out. Any other suggestions? <coughs> yes, yeah, Sammy? Can we play big and small? Is that a real game, or is that a game you just made up? It's a real game that I just made up. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe you can explain that to me later. This movie has quite a few actors that have, since this movie, gone on to prominence for different roles. Yeah, absolutely. Brie, Brie Larson, of course, is now Captain Marvel within the MCU, and she's she's, she's done you know more hard-hitting dramas. Since this movie, Room is the first one that comes to mind. John Gallagher Jr., I'll be honest, the first thing I thought of was Ted and Cloverfield Lane. And also Remy Malek before he became uh, Freddie Mercury. Yes, and Mr. Robot. Yeah. Of course, Lakeith, Lakeith Stanfield has since made, made it big with um, Get Out. And then he was most recently in, at least far from what I've seen, uh, he was in Knives Out by Ryan Johnson. Oh, don't forget, sorry to bother you. 
where he plays yes a, which i still need to see joe i want to get your thoughts on that movie because that is a trip of a movie i was gonna say apparently he was also in the 2017 remake of death note as l which yes is- he was i saw that yeah i forgot about that I, I tried to repress that because it's so botches up the anime yeah 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 you know what? Actually, I'm going to kind of say something about Lakeith. This movie, uh, Short Term 12, was his breakthrough role. Because if not for this film, he probably would not have pursued acting. There's a, a special story that the um, director and writer of this movie, because Lakeith was actually in the original one, um, the short film that he did. Same role, same character. But when uh, the director was adapting it for a featured film, Lakeith basically had given up on acting. He had basically canceled his managers. He was getting off of social media, and there's no way of contacting him. So when Cranston was trying to reach out to him, uh, the only way he could get through him to him was email. And it had not been for this role and probably the critical reception everyone gave Lakeith for this role, he would not have gone on to acting the way he has done. He probably would have pursued a small um, career of just being a rapper, you know, living kind of like just a low profile. But this movie is what got him into stardom. And it definitely shows. He's He's fantastic in this freaking movie. Yeah, yeah, I think he was he was easily a highlight of the film. And cool story as well. Um, there's a scene in here, the rap scene, where he does mm-hmm. with John Gallagher. Yeah. Um, originally, that was written by the director, but Lakeith took it, rewrote quite a few of the raps, and put in more personal anecdotes into there. So what you kind of mm-hmm. get is a little bit more of actually Lakeith spilling himself out on screen, which is... Which is freaking amazing because you're listening to it. It's just a one take on Lakeith as he's rapping. And it's like, whoa, this is heavy. And it feels real. It's, it's actually like for, for for being in a movie and for, you know, being created for a movie. It's like, that's actually pretty good. Make some bars. Yeah. No, and I think that's uh, that's the one thing I like about this movie is um, these actors are bringing their A game to this. And for such a small, like it was only like for like a million dollars that this movie was shot on. But everyone's bringing their freaking A game to this part. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing that struck me about this movie is that so many actors you can see them grow on screen over the course of their careers, but so many so many of these actors are just coming out as heavy hitters right out the gate with this movie. There, there wasn't a bad performance. Even Remy Malek, who isn't given a real beefy role in this movie, he's great for what he's given. I, I in fact, in fact, he's kind of the comedic fringe part of the movie that kind of lifted it up a little bit when it got too dark. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, like even like a stiff and as like rigid as it is, you do feel that he's playing it well. He's playing it really good. Like he's doing like as if that character would act that way. His whole his whole character arc is to go from wearing button up shirts to uh, wearing looser fitting, more casual clothes. <laughs> you know what? That's actually something I'm going to put this in. But one thing I paid attention to this in this film, and it's so weird to talk about because it, it's not a heavy costume film. But the costume choices for each character is fantastic. Um, everything from a key from what he's wearing to, you know, something as simple as like him removing his build cap. It's kind of showing his transformation. Even the girl who's um, kind of like the main focus B storyline that we're focused on, to, you know, trying to rescue from all this. Her costume design shows that like she's wearing ripped jeans. She's wearing prison bar uh, T-shirts and it just shines very well on that. And as you mentioned, Rami Malek does this transformation where he comes in wearing a tie to the very end where he's just wearing slacks and a hoodie. And I think something like that, just that little detail in the production design is actually does wonders for this movie. Yeah. It's something I hadn't really thought about actively while watching the movie, but I think you, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I think it kind of brings it all together and brings it a little bit more down to earth, which I think is like where this movie really shines or like why it really shines. It's just, it's a very down to earth movie. I think, you know, one thing actually I thought this, this movie handled very, very well. And I think we've touched on it quite a bit right now already is how the trauma of these kids is revealed through little things like stories, music, kind of like motifs and props that they're using. You don't have to get everything that has happened in full detail. You don't have to get a flashback scene. You can get enough from just what they're sharing. There's a scene with Jaden where she's telling a story to Grace and you get everything of what has happened to her to to basically where she's at. Same thing with Marcus, his rap song. You get everything that, even like actually his haircut scene, you get what he's been through just from those little things and just how the dialogue is set in the present time. And I think for something like this, 
it could have gone the complete 180 and shown kids in horrible situations and shown what has happened and it being too on the nose like that. And it would have taken you out. But this was enough to like give you just a glimpse without putting any of these actors in a terrible kind of like scenario. And I think the movie just straddled that line very well. Alrighty, so with that, let's go ahead and move into final thoughts. So, uh, Nate, why don't you go ahead and tell us your final thoughts on the movie and pick a moment from the movie to to highlight as we as we leave. Sure, absolutely. I think the movie, um, when I first saw it, and even as I revisit again today, it's what I think uh, a lot of indie movies try to strive for. Sometimes they miss the mark on this because maybe they get too scripty, they get too pretentious, or they get so heavy with the drama. This is a perfect example of how to handle a story very small scale like this, but packed with a lot of emotion and drama. And I think the key with this is that it does empathy very well. There's something about how uh, the director um, just brought a lot of his experience. He allowed the actors to bring their experiences to it, and he was very open. And it's just a great catharsis of all that strung together in this very small, um, low budget film that really just delivers emotion home. Um, and the scene I want to talk about is actually a scene that didn't make the final cut of this movie. The original one that the director wanted to go for would have been over two hours long. And right now this is at the uh, 96 minutes long, but it was actually a scene that was cut out of Brie Larson at a therapy session with her therapist. And what's great about that is it's that scene is six minutes long, but it's just Brie Larson going through a kind of, um, I want to say like an alternative therapy session where she is describing a visual as she's closing her eyes, but you can see she is finally getting out of this hole that she's been dwelling in for such a long time and finding this light with the kids at the treatment center, helping them find a better future and how they are elevating her. It's a great little moment. And honestly, if it hadn't been for the scene that we got for the final cut, this actually would have been a perfect um, scene to end the whole movie on because it ends just on the right note. And I think it sums up the movie very well. Awesome. Alex? I enjoyed the movie. It was it was not as like dark and depressing as I thought it was going to be, which I liked. I think it's good. <laughs> uh, I Because I don't think I was really prepared for it to really get too heavy, but it, it doesn't dip too far into it. it 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 definitely deals with a lot of like um very mature themes and very very just generally heavy topics in the movie but it, it handles them well and it handles them without making sort of like a spectacle out of them which i think um is really great i kind of said earlier on it's a very down-to-earth movie and i think that's kind of like what i like best about it um all the acting is great um the way it's shot is is good as well. I, I wouldn't say it's anything noteworthy, but it just it does what it needs to. And there was no point where I was really like, you know, specifically enamored with the cinematography or anything like that. It was just it it worked for the film and it didn't try to, you know, stick out too much. So that's all I can really ask for for that. I think the scene that I liked most was the scene where they cut uh, Marcus's hair. That scene, I think, was probably one of the, like, the saddest, for me at least. Just the, It was just a very simple scene, just the three of them in, in the bathroom. Just that, that I think, that scene right there, um, I think really kind of like highlights how great the acting is for in, in the movie. And also just the writing as well, because I think in the beginning, when, when he says for his birthday, he just wants to shave his head, you don't know what the meaning behind this yeah. is. But then when it finally comes to that and he's looking at it and he says, I just want to make sure there's no scars or bumps. Yeah. Is it smooth? I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. That, yeah. Then it like really hits you and you're just like, damn, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And and I think that's the ingenious of this film is that, that you're right. That scene is a good summation of how great the writing and acting in this mm-hmm. film is. Absolutely. Yep. So, Joe. I really enjoyed this movie. I I, I loved it quite a bit. You know, as I mentioned before, as far as kind of hard-hitting, mature movies on difficult topics, I think it deals with a lot of them very well. For me personally, I didn't get, you know, super <clears throat> emotionally invested or, or teary-eyed as I have in some movies. But I think it's just because stuff that hits me really hardest today, I think, 
our stuff that had to do with parenthood, with me having, you know, toddlers and, and kids in the house now and stuff that had to do with parenthood and fatherhood and that kind of stuff. But I have had uh, situations where I d- dealt with and had difficult conversations with people who have dealt with some of these serious issues and with depression and that kind of stuff. I felt like this movie dealt with those issues very well, very sensitively, while being very real about them. So yeah, I, I, I thought it was a fantastic, well-made movie, heavy-hitting actors all around. I, I now want to go in and check out some of this director's other movies since then. I think he did um, I think he did another movie with uh, Lakeith Stanfield recently, didn't he? I don't think it was Lakeith. I think it was uh, Michael B. Jordan. Mm-hmm. I might be misquoted. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mike, Michael B. Jordan, Just, Just Mercy. Yes, that's the movie, yes. Just so, Mercy. So I want to get around to watching that one because, I mean, that one already, already looked good. But, you know, now seeing what he's done before, I really want to see, check out some of this other stuff that he's done since then. Uh, the movie moment I'm going to pick, uh, Alex, I almost went with another Marcus scene. I was going to, I was, I was oh, going to yeah. go with the rapping scene. It's a really good scene. Yeah. There's a lot of great scenes in this movie. Uh, but the one I think I'm going to stick with, uh, that kind of hit me, I don't want to say the hardest, but you know, it, 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 it really affected me the most was when Grace and Jaden are sitting down in front of the house after Grace, uh, has gone into the house with the baseball bat to confront Jaden's dad and just them sitting down and having that moment of connection, realizing that the, the abuse and the hurt they've both had in the past connected to each other. Because they, one thing I love about this movie is how Grace's history of abuse, she had to eventually face that through helping Jaden out. And the two of them connecting in that moment was just a really powerful moment for me. So yeah, sitting down in front of the house afterwards. Before they decide to, uh, basically beat up the guy's car in every room. <laughs> exactly. That was a cool scene. <laughs> Actually, a, moment, a big moment of catharsis right there. Yeah. So, Joe, um, what's the next feel-good movie we should watch for a pick a flick? You tell me, Nate. So, uh, uh, next, next pick a flick's going to be Nate's turn. Nate, what do you have for us to watch next episode? Well, you know, me being a Marvel guy, I thought, let's watch an adventure movie who, also like a lot of the parents in this movie, is toxic. Let's do it. All right. Basically, it's the Toxic Adventure. We're going to watch the Toxic Adventure. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. This is going to be such a roller coaster from week to oh, week. I, we got to switch it up, man. We got to go from pretty low to high to middle, you know, to anime, basically. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so tune in next episode uh, when we'll be talking about the Toxic Avenger to follow up our short term 12 <laughs> conversation. That'll do it for this episode of the Film Illiterates podcast. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at filmilliterates.com. Nate, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me here at Film Illiterates. I do the podcast with these two. I also basically are I'm on Instagram uh, doing cosplay stuff, uh, other fun projects. Um, but I also am on Letterboxd uh, under Ivan Glazeberg. You can watch what I've been watching and my reviews in more detail than here. Alex? You can find me at a number of places. If you want to find out what I'm listening to, I'm on Rate Your Music. Wa- check out what, what anime I'm watching on my anime list. Um, I'm also on Twitter and then Letterbox as well. Everything except the Twitter will be under Half Scrim, H-A-L-F-S-C-R-I-M. And then Twitter is at, is at Alex D. Patton. You can find me on Twitter at Film Alerts as well as on Letterboxd. Uh, under film literates so you can watch follow my movie watching habits and you can find all of our videos podcast episodes at uh, filmilliterates.com with that everyone keep watching movies and keep it easy